And then Frisbee was like, we uh, don't use light years here. Let's convert it. <laughs> no, we don't use parsecs here. We don't use parsecs around these parts. <laughs> See, Orion. I just pushed the live button, so everything is okay. on, on the record oh. now from this point forward. Orion is 400 parsecs away, 420. So that's 1,200-ish. Yeah. Multiply by three. Multiply right. by pi. Basically, yeah. Yeah. <sighs> we All did right. it. Well, we're back. And we're back. It's good to be and back. I am. Yeah. I am impressed that we're on time because I have a fraction of my technology here that I'm able to do the show with, um, and I am dropping frames like mad. But hopefully, I've I've stopped. I think when I when I start up the stream, it drops a bunch of frames and then seems to settle down. Come on, Starlink hold so how did everybody's summer go kimberly it was a summer it it got warm and now it's not warm anymore and everything else in my life pretty much stayed the same yeah everything it was still a pandemic i was still working from home yeah everything's just a timeless blur days Things, one after my the hair other. changed from purple to red Trapped. that was the most eventful thing that happened this summer I changed my hair color. Right. Trapped in the jail uh, that is your house. That is. Did some gardening. Nice. There was there was lots of tomatoes. I got lots of tomatoes this year. Maybe Chris. that was the most eventful thing that happened. Chris, how was your summer? Uh, it was pretty hot. Uh, I think this summer in New York was like, was like pretty, pretty hellish. It was like ninety degrees quite consistently. So. Not not a lot of time spent outdoors, yeah. but I'm very much looking forward to fall weather, mm. uh, and, and all the beautiful trees and the and the sweaters. So right. I'm in a much better place. Finally, now. you could dig into those sweaters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Alex. Uh, it's been okay. You know, uh, Taipei is super hot in the summer. It's my first summer here, uh, so it's routinely running like 35 Celsius outside. And, uh, but you know, got through it and it's, the weather's starting to just cool off a little bit now. So that's quite nice. We had a lockdown in May 15th, uh, you know, sort of, uh, not complete lockdown, but you know, we finally had an outbreak after like a year and a half of having no COVID, but we've basically gotten it under control. Now we've had seven, six, seven straight days of zero COVID in the entire country. Um, people are starting to get vaccinated. So we've kind of got it back under control again. looks like, yeah, uh, not, yeah. knock on wood. That's awesome. Yeah, we're yeah. at the worst state of the entire pandemic now here. Really? Yeah. And we're like what? mostly vaccinated. Like I think we're hitting 90 plus 92% vaccinated, but wow, that's we've got really high. we've got more people with COVID now and more people in hospital on the west side of Canada than in the history of of COVID. Yeah, it's been a disaster. So That's wow. crazy. Yeah. yeah, we've managed to basically lock Delta variant out of the country oh. so far. I think that's made even it New Zealand threw in the towel. So, so yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Taiwan, yeah, 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 yeah. They just couldn't get a hold of Delta, right? So that's I think that's really the entire difference between us and New Zealand right now is that we've yeah. still kind of kept it kept awesome. it at bay. Crazy. Uh, I walked right. through the giant field of flags by the Washington Monument the other week. Ooh, they're going to need more flags. Yeah, it is absolutely surreal. Yeah. And yeah. I have opinions and none of them are flattering. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> or All right. polite. So now we move into my desperate attempt to actually engineer this episode. Um, so, uh, okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to have to manually, oh, this is going to suck. Okay. But next, next week, I think Pamela and team are going to be, all right, let's see if I can do this. All right. So next week, Pamela and team are going to be um, engineering the episode. So I don't have to, and that should take a load off of my Starlink, which is currently carrying the entire weight of this episode. So once uh, once we're we're there, that should things should go well. But there's going to be a million mistakes. I apologize in advance, but let's get on with the show. All right. Let's see if I can find my screen. Okay, here we go. Welcome to the weekly space hangout for Wednesday, October sixth, twenty twenty one. 
the new season. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about evidence of the first circum triple planet. Come on, Alex. Uh, we're let's go for about, it, babe. Let's, let's go, go for, for it. All of the <laughs> missions that are coming up into the fall and the Milky Way's broken arm. Joining me this week, let's see, we've got uh, Alex Tichi. Alex, welcome back. Thank you. It's good to be back, Fraser. I gotta remove that pin. Oh, this is gonna this is gonna be tough. Okay, awesome. C glad you're back. Glad you uh, you survived your your hot Taipei summer, and now you're ready to uh, to science with the rest of us. For sure. Um, we've got uh, Dr. Kimberly Cartier. Hey, Kimberly. Hello. It is podcast day once again. Happy Hello. podcast day. Happy podcast day, everyone. And uh, last but not least, we got uh, Chris Carr. Hey, Chris. Hello. Ready to start the third, my third year here with uh, wow. WSH. Yeah, you are, you're a grizzled veteran at this point. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, uh, all right. So before we get on to this week's special guest, I want to give a big shout out, of course, to our good friends, fans at the Weekly Space Hangout crew. They uh, coordinate and produce behind the scenes. They round up all of the guests as well as all of my co-hosts do all of the pre and post production of the show and generally keep each other informed about space and astronomy through the long hot summer while we're in hiatus. Uh, so if you want to join this incredible community, go to wshcrew.space and they will hook you up with your executive producer credentials so that you can bring on guests onto this show. And speaking of guests coming onto this show, we've got uh, Josh Stoff. Josh, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. Oh, great. I uh, really appreciate you guys uh, having me. All right. The question I always like to ask is, uh, is, who are you? What do you do? Okay. I'm the curator of the Cradle of Aviation Museum, which is a fairly good-sized air and space museum out on Long Island, about an hour, well, 45 minutes east of uh, New York City. And we kind of focus on the history of aviation and space flight as seen through what happened on Long Island, Long Island companies that contributed, Long Island people who were involved, the historic events that happened here, and really the impact that Long Island aviation and space flight had on the greater world. So we're kind of unique among the air and space museums in that we really have a local focus, but the story that we tell has uh, worldwide implications. Now, I am definitely a uh, space and uh, space aviation museum aficionado. I've been to a bunch of the good ones. I've seen the space shuttle many times. Uh, what are some of the treasures that you have in your facility? Uh, we have about 75 aircraft and spacecraft Whoa. going uh, our oldest one is uh, 1909, and it comes up to uh, fairly recently. And um, most of the collection was built locally on Long Island, Long Island companies. We don't just collect anything. So out of that 75, maybe 65, were all local products. Uh, we have aircraft uh, ranging from a Blario 1909, the first aircraft ever brought into the United States from overseas. We have planes from World War One, World War Two, local planes, Grumman Republic built big, many, you know, thousands of military aircraft during uh, World War II, jet fighters, uh, Republic, uh, Thunder Chief, Grumman F-14 going into the jet age and spacecraft going back to the beginning of the uh, space program. Robert Goddard got all his funding from Long Island, from uh, the Guggenheims and uh, developed through uh, Grumman, uh, of course, with the Luna module was really with the most, certainly the most historic vehicle ever built on Long Island. And we are very pleased to have two and a half of them, which is more than anybody two, in the two, world. Wait, wait a second. Yeah. Two, two and a half of them? <laughs> how, do you, how, do you, how do you get half? Uh, we have the, uh, Luna, the one uh, Luna module simulator, which is basically the ascent stage. Right. Uh, complete, has the most complete interior of any uh, surviving Luna module, has the full interior all dating from Apollo, and that's the simulator that all the astronauts trained in. So, and we have it open, kind of opened up like a clamshell, so you can see the whole interior, kind of unique, see the front and the back, and really amazingly uh, how cramped it was and really how crude the technology was uh, of the time. And so was, was Grumman operating out of Long Island? Grumman is from Bethpage, Long Island, uh, founded in the, uh, around 1930, and they're still there to some extent as Northrop Grumman yep. today. And uh, still involved in the space program. They have the contract for the Lunar Gateway. So uh, hopefully yep. they're 
some tradition going to be uh, continuing there. But uh, yeah, they were, they were certainly the biggest aerospace company on Long Island, but there were a total of about uh, 80 aerospace companies on Long Island uh, hmm. manufacturing aircraft going back over 100 years. So what, I guess, like what's an event that happened on on Long Island that that our viewers may just not be aware of? Uh, not be aware of. Well, probably the most famous one that people might not realize happened there was Lindbergh's flight. And uh, when he flew from New York to Paris, took off from Long Island. And uh, that really changed the aviation world. Uh, it's certainly one of the most historic events in the history of aviation. Uh, popularized aviation like nothing else before or since. And uh, even though people uh, realized the uh, spirit of St. Louis was as no use as a commercial aircraft, but when Lindbergh threw the ocean alone, it yeah. first gave people the idea, you know what, I might actually get on an airplane too. Because people really weren't flying before that liable. But when Lindbergh flew from point to point, he got to where he was going on time and uh, got there safely. It really revolutionized the way people viewed aviation. So that really changed the world. That's uh, as far as a single event on Long Island. And I would say military production in World War II was another highlight. So many, uh, a high percentage of American fighters built during World War II were manufactured locally, uh, going into jet aircraft and in war. And of course, in the Apollo program, Long Island was one of the centers of uh, what was going on in Apollo. Uh, all the astronauts were here working uh, lunar module training here and uh, it was really a uh, cutting edge technology of the time. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing how like during the Apollo era and even during the space shuttle and even with SLS, parts mm -hmm. of the program were built across the entire United States. Pretty much in every, every state had mm -hmm. some role to play in bringing these these together so so what is something with a i guess a long island bent that you would love to get your hands on what's your what's your white whale oh boy that's a, a good uh, question um well something of course we'll never get is a space shuttle because about half of that was built on long island really uh, uh, actually, Grumman built uh, about half the space shuttle, and uh, another company, Republic, also built uh, the tail control surfaces. Republic, uh, Grumman built the wings, the ailerons, landing gear doors. And so I would say half of it was locally built. We're never going to see a space shuttle. There's an uh, enterprise in New York City is as close as we're going to get. We do have some large chunks of space shuttle, though, including part of the a large piece of the tail that was flown quite a few times. So, uh, uh, I, it's hard to say. I mean, it would be nice if we could uh, down the road get a module of a mock-up of the Lunar Gateway to kind of bring our story up to date. That would be very cool to show people some cutting-edge technology. So, you know, I'm always poking around looking for something relevant to add to the collection. Well, there's, I mean, there's even more to it. Like, I know Northrop Grumman is working on some lunar landing. They developed a prototype for a lunar landing system. I know they were... Uh, considering that. So it'll be interesting to see sort of what the future of, you know, I think, I think the, the contract went to SpaceX, but they were considering like a private lunar lander with, I forget who they were working with. They were teamed with, uh, you know, Blue Origin. Yeah, 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 exactly. So anyway, yeah. there's, you know, there's a lot of great, I mean, I love, I get a chance to see all of this great technology that, I'm sure it's just cardboard, right? But they're but they're showing off what this thing is going to look like and showing, you know, they're they're inflating the balloon and when nobody's looking at, you know, it starts to deflate again, but but to have to see some of the alternative pathways to space exploration would be great for people to be able to see and get inspired by by some mm -hmm. of those those ideas. Um but I had no idea that that much if if you you know, even if you could get your hands on say one of the space shuttles rocket engines you'd probably have to give it up again because they're all getting fed into the sls at this point which is hard to believe that they're recycling used space shuttle uh, engines for that yeah. program you know that uh, well sls is a whole nother story yeah. won't get to, but it's it's not a happy story so far well they're they're the most i mean the the rs-25 engines the ones that came with the space shuttle are the most beautiful engines that humanity has like ever created the most high performance engines are the Ferrari of rocket engines. And, uh, and you know, the space shuttle tried to bring as many of them back to earth as possible. And now SLS is gonna, just going to be ditching them into the ocean, which breaks my heart every time I, I think about this. But um, so where does the, uh, where does the museum go from here? 
Well, we're uh, raising money to put a big new expansion onto the museum, uh, a good sized building, which would uh, certainly make us uh, a much larger player than we are now for showing new aircraft and spacecraft and new room for education space and uh, a proper library archive. We have really a substantial archive that we've gathered over the last 40 years and really we're one of the uh, focal points for the Apollo program archives. We have certainly the best lunar module archive, uh, photos, papers, you know, manuals, wow. everything. So, and, and it's really never been properly uh, preserved and uh, shown to the public. So it would be exciting to have this world-class archive and, uh, you know, new exhibit space going. But the uh, museum, we were uh, doing great, you know, before COVID. Now our attendance is not what it used to be, but our attendance pre-COVID was about 350,000 people a year. Wow probably top 10 in air and space museums in the United States. So uh, we were doing great. And I mean, that attendance is coming back uh, yeah. slow, but it's definitely coming back. And I think by spring, we'll be back to uh, normal. So that's- and, uh, and so now even during the pandemic, you are back in operation. I'm sure there's various regulations required. Uh, we are back. We're only closed for two months, uh, you know, right at the beginning in that spring. And uh, we've been steadily coming back uh, since then. So the public the public attendance is basically back to normal. We don't have the school groups. We did used to do great with the schools, and I don't think we'll see them until the spring. So if people want to keep track of, of what you guys are working on, maybe get a chance to see what you have at hand, uh, where should they go? Well, we have uh, go to our website, www.cradleofaviation.org. One word, Cradle of Aviation, and uh, there's a lot going on. We have a big, you know, big dome theater. And we do, uh, once COVID's listing, we do a lot of uh, events that are uh, very popular. And uh, we're always uh, adding new things to the museum. You know, a museum is never done. Um, every, every single year we add new exhibits, we add to the collection. We slowly make the museum just keep getting better and better. And it's a story that really uh, won't end because uh, the story of uh, aviation space flight doesn't end. We're probably in the middle somewhere. So, you know, we'll just keep getting uh, growing and getting better over time. And uh, that's the way it should be. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today and, and good luck navigating right. out the other side of this pandemic okay. All right. Well, and getting uh, that space shuttle. All right. Thanks. Thank All right. Apparently, uh, so let's see, why did this happen? There's something wrong with the output. So let me, uh, see if I can fix it. Oh, I know why. That's not it. There we go. Okay. Apologies. At some point it went off of live and the full screen and screwed up. But I warned you that this is this is what's going to happen, everybody. Uh, one last week. But the people in the audio, they won't even know. It'll just sound great to them. Uh, all right. <laughs> we can fix it in post. Yeah, exactly. We'll, we'll fix it in post. All right, Alex, you uh, you volunteered. So uh, why don't you tell us uh, what you got for us this week? Yeah, so this was a paper that uh, caught my eye about this uh, system called GW. I was trying to figure out how to pronounce it. GW Orionis, or I kind of want to call it Orionis. It seems like it sounds a little nicer. Anyway, it's a, a protoplanetary disk in the, well, we call it protoplanetary disk. It's a disk of material. Um, in the constellation of Orion, and it is orbiting. Uh, actually, this disk is around three different uh, three stars. It's a triple system. Now, triple systems are not that crazy. Um, you know, uh, we have fully 40, 50 percent of the stars in our Milky Way galaxy are in binaries, and the estimate I've seen is something like 20 percent uh, will be in triples. And so, you know, this is three stars orbiting one another. Now, you don't, aren't going to always have, uh, you know, typically the way that this is going to be structured is what we call a hierarchical triple, meaning you have a sort of a binary uh, star system and you have a third star kind of going around the pair of those. If you ever see simulations with three stars that are all just kind of orbiting each other, it's, you know, very chaotic. And that doesn't really last very long until you uh, kick one of the stars out of the system. It's just uh, too unstable. So typically, like I say, you have two stars orbiting one another and the third one kind of going around the pair. And that's what we uh, have here. Now, we've also uh, discovered uh, planets around some triples, uh, but this would potentially be the first uh, planet that is going around all three stars. Mm -hmm. So ordinarily you might have 
a planet going around one of the stars in the trip or it might be going around the binary but this is the first time you have the three stars and then the planet going around all three which is kind of wild interesting now it's not entirely demonstrated but this new paper uh you know makes a convincing case so what do they do here we've got a disk of material and this has been known for a while and it has been observed with alma you've seen these incredible alma images of these uh, disks of material and it's a disk and then you can see these gaps in the disk now these uh, gaps are very interesting to uh, us astronomers because we think maybe uh there is a planet in the gap. It's a little more complex than that. It could be that there's a planet inside the gap. Some people think maybe these are snow lines and, you know, something about the, the sort of the heat uh, distribution through the disk creates these sort of gaps in the rings, or it could be a sort of an indirect dynamical effect so that you don't necessarily have the planet right there, but you have the planet some other place and it is causing these, uh, uh, these gaps in the ring. Nevertheless, we see these rings and this disk, by the way, is something like 400 astronomical units um, in uh, in radius. So these disks are very large, much larger than our um, our solar system. A lot of interesting puzzles uh, with respect to these disks. Anyway, with uh, GW Orionis, we see this disk and it has these uh, uh, separate rings that are uh, uncoupled from one another. So they are misaligned with respect to one another. And that's very interesting, right? You, you, uh, you can see if you have a, just a disk, it might get warped uh, by dynamical processes, but once they actually separate from one another and become separate wing rings, they process independently of one another. And so what this new paper did by Jeremy Smallwood et al. Uh, is actually the third paper kind of looking at the dynamics of this system. And they modeled it with uh, what we call in-body simulations, meaning you have throw a bunch of particles in your computer and they're uh, moving around gravitationally. And they also use hydrodynamic uh, simulations, so simulating it uh, like a fluid. And they were asking the question whether uh, this third star in the system, the tertiary star, whether it is capable of being uh, of producing this misalignment of the of the rings that we see. And their conclusion, long story short, is that no, the star itself is really not capable of producing the torques that you would need uh, to produce this misalignment. And so they infer that there must be one or maybe. Uh, more planets in the system. This is in contrast to a uh, work that came out last year, Krauss et al. 2020, says, uh, no, it can be the star and you don't need the planet hypothesis. It's not strange that you would have planets um, in this situation, obviously, because it's a, well, I called it before, a protoplanetary disk, right? This is where we expect planets to form. And so it's not a crazy hypothesis to say, yeah, it's probably a, a planet in there uh, somewhere. But you know, what is responsible for this uh, decoupling of the of the rings is an open question. And um, and so they, uh, uh, you know, it all kind of comes down to uh, one thing that's really critical is how dense the material is, you know, how viscous is the material in these disks and what is the density of the of the material. And that actually sort of plays a major role in how you come out on the one side or the other of, of, uh, of this question. So still a lot of open questions in terms of trying to actually, you know, verify through other means uh, whether or not this planet is really there. Uh, you'd probably want to go with direct imaging, but it's very difficult. This system is uh, quite far away. And also just the fact that you're, uh, oh, by the way, being far away means that the angular separation between the star and the planet is going to be quite small. So that's challenging. You'd also, you know, think you about said ordinarily. 400, you said yeah. 400 AU, right? Uh, well, the disk itself is quite large. The planet, they say, would okay. maybe be somewhere around uh, 100 AU or so based on their modeling. But the system is about 1300 light years away. So, right. so you know, you can just imagine the farther away you get, the, uh, the angular separation between the star and the planet gets smaller. They calculate something like 0.25 arc seconds yeah. um, when it comes to direct seen imaging. Yeah. Some, we've ahead. seen some incredible images from the European Southern Observatory's sphere instrument of these newly forming planets, these dust disks, like this is the kind of system that the VLT is is perfect for observing. You know, yeah, well, yeah, it's ideally. So far, and it's so tiny. Right, right. Yeah. So the disks, but the disks itself make it uh, challenging, right? Because now you've got all this other material. Um, when you look at these sort of speckle imaging, direct imaging is really spectacular. I don't, I don't think uh, 
people that work outside of direct imaging properly realize how challenging it is to really extract uh, the planets from from this data. They're looking at all of these different wavelengths and they're trying to uh, separate the you know the real signal from the noise and it's spectacularly difficult when we see these planets pop out that's after a lot of work yeah. uh, to get those yeah. images and so the disk itself uh, evidently is going to uh, make that challenging also just the fact that you have three stars in the system uh, complicates the coronagraph situation right you can't put a single sort of <laughs> right, dot of over course. over yeah. the star and now you've got all these you know you've got three stars to deal with yeah um so it's uh, you know it's quite interesting it's like I say going to be hard to confirm this uh, outside of this, you know, very complex modeling of the system to infer the plant trip, uh, presence of a planet. Nevertheless, it could very well be the first uh, detection of a planet going around three stars, which is kind of interesting. We're, we're still finding exotic systems that people don't really expect and new superlatives coming down the pike. <laughs> yeah. So then what is what is the long term stability of a system like this? I mean, as you as you said, you know, the the classic binary planets that we know of you either get the two stars orbiting around each other and that planet going around both of them or you get the stars with enough separation that the planet can orbit one or the other and not get into any kind of mayhem three stars right. orbiting each other and then the planet around all of that i mean you've got to have some wacky three-body interactions happening with those stars is this stable uh, presumably. So this particular paper didn't um, go too much into long term uh, stability. Of course, these are young systems. It's only 10 million years old or something, or maybe even younger than that. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's certainly an open question whether or not a system like this could could you know live for billions of years. Uh, but that was sort of uh, one key part of this paper was they had to determine uh, you know, how do you model this thing? Uh, uh, and what they did was they said, well, you know, this interior binary is separated by about one astronomical unit. The tertiary star has a separation of about eight AU. Um, and so one of the first things they do is say, can we model this as a binary rather than a triple? So we'll treat the inner binary as a single point source and, uh, and the tertiary is sort of the second in the binary. And in their simulations, they say, yeah, uh, for all intents and purposes, this is, can be approximated as a two body system. Uh, and then the planet is going around uh, uh, both of those. And when we think about binary planets, there's really two configurations. Uh, you know, excuse, excuse me, a, a planet going around a binary system. There's two configurations, right? It could either be going around both stars or it could be going around the one. We call this a, a P-type uh, circumbinary or an S-type, S for satellite versus planet-like, satellite-like. Um, and so in this case, it would be like a P-type right. circumbinary. Um, it just so happens that the, you know, the inner single source is, is, yeah. is too quick for, yeah. I mean, like it I sounds said, like it must just be in perfect, like in perfect balance that you've got the, the two stars are orbiting each other. The third star is orbiting them in a way that is stable. And then the planet is orbiting the gravitational average of all of those stars in a way that is also stable. And maybe that planet has a moon and maybe that planet's moon has a moon. Who knows? Um, <laughs> but so, so you're standing on the surface of this planet and you're experiencing sunrise sunset what are you seeing uh yeah that's a great question so they they actually mentioned this uh just as a point of curiosity i suppose in the paper they said unfortunately if you're standing on this uh or maybe this was in one of the articles about the paper that i read now that i think of it but the you know you're at maybe a hundred AU, so very, very, you know, three times. Right, the, so your this, eyeballs are frozen, you know, well, and you're encased in in solid nitrogen. Uh, yeah, super, super cold, and so you're very far away from these host stars. The inner binary, they said, would just look like a single star. You know, I mean, you wouldn't even be able to really resolve this one AU difference with your eye, which is uh, quite remarkable. Uh, and then the other, you know, uh, star is a appreciable dif distance away. So depending on where you are in your orbit, you, you know, you'd see them uh, more separated. But again, you know, probably a dark sky, you know, at that uh, at that distance, you're seeing the you're seeing the stars, but they look like very bright stars in your sky rather than, yeah. uh, rather than a proper sun. Yeah. So it's like you would never see like a really brilliant separation of the three stars and a hot Tatooine <laughs> desert landscape. You're always just going to see um, just like one star that you icebergs. maybe, you know, it's, yeah. it, and it's really dark. It's like nighttime all the time, even when the sun is out. Yeah. 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 That yeah. sounds, 
That sounds uh, mediocre, cool. but still very cool. <laughs> I'll stick with Earth. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, exactly. I'll... Yeah. Still the best planet in the universe. Nice try, exactly. triple star system. All right. <laughs> awesome, Alex. Thanks. Uh, yep. Kimberly, what have you got for us? I've got all sorts of satellites for us. Uh, I'm going to try and do this. Each one just like super fast okay. because there's a lot of satellite updates since the last time we spoke. Pray I don't have any questions. Me and audience spoke. All right. So here is a blast of satellites. <laughs> and a pun. Sorry, that was a really bad pun. Thanks, Dad. Um, You're welcome. Uh, so in order of when they launched because I had to organize things. Um, there is the Pepe Colombo satellite, which is a European Space Agency mission that launched in 2018. It's going to arrive at Mercury in 2025. And just a couple days ago on October 1st, it did its first flyby of its target planet, Mercury. And oh my gosh, was I so excited to see those yes. pictures of the surface of Mercury. Those pictures, if you've seen them floating around the interwebs, uh, we're taken from about a thousand kilometers above the surface, which is not as close as the flyby actually was. It was closer to like 200 kilometers above the surface, but they arrived at nighttime. So they couldn't actually get a good picture of Mercury's surface at their closest approach. So the closest image you'll see is from about a thousand kilometers away. Uh, the team called the performance of, uh, of the satellite flawless, which is awesome to hear. Uh, Bepi Colombo still has a really long journey. Uh, it has five more Mercury flybys to do before it finally settles into orbit. It's already done an Earth flyby and two Venus flybys. And now it's just Mercury, Mercury, Mercury. And we're all so excited for that. It's, it's uh, amazing how difficult it is to get to Mercury. Like it's so difficult. And it's not, it, it's a very diff different problem than we have getting to far away planets where we need to add momentum and add speed in order to actually get there in some sort of decent sort of time. Yep. We have to take away speed. We have to shed momentum as we approach Mercury because Mercury is rather close to the sun, which has an awful lot of gravity, which tugs on uh, the spacecraft and gets it and it tries to, you know, suck it into the sun, which is not what we want if we want to get to Mercury instead. So all of these flybys are to help it shed a little bit of momentum to break a little bit and to get it into the right alignment so that it can enter orbit around Mercury uh, and conduct its studies. And, and so Bepi Colombo. And so Bepi Colombo, uh, just to add, is named after an Italian scientist who helped figure out the gravitational slingshot. He help yep. work out these orbital maneuvers and so for the spacecraft that is like the most orbital maneuvery it has a, nine orbital maneuvers yeah. nine planetary flybys from launch until orbital insertion uh it's absolutely crazy um yeah. but we're finally at the mercury 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 stage of the <laughs> it's literally it's Marshall, it was Marshall. earth and yeah. then yeah it was earth and then venus venus and then six mercury flybys all right what's so next we're gonna get lots Next one. Yeah. I yeah, spent too much time on Bepi Colombo because right? I love it. The, sorry. I'm looking at the time here. So. I know. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry in advance, Chris. <laughs> uh, the next one is Landsat 9 from NASA, which is I, every Landsat mission I, uh, I just adore. Uh, it is an Earth observing mission that has been going since 1972. This is the, this is the ninth Landsat satellite. Uh, it does brilliant uh, observations of the Earth system in all of its glory. Uh, it, uh, its measurements impact agriculture, ecosystems, and our understanding of biodiversity. It helps us monitor natural disasters, the state of our forests and carbon cycles, and of course, climate change. Uh, so this is an incredibly important mission. It launched um, uh, in September, late September. Uh, it's joining Landsat 8, which is its predecessor. Uh, and also a European uh, Earth observing satellite, Sentinel-2. Uh, it has visible and infrared imagers, uh, and it's going to be producing uh, brand new images of the Earth's surface, the complete Earth's surface, about every two days in very high resolution. Um, and it's going to be a staple of uh, us understanding the Earth system for decades to come. And the incredible thing about Landsat is 
all of the pictures are freely available on the internet. They're all freely available, yeah. all the, not just the images, but all of the data too. They're all freely available online. You can download them yourself, process them, and learn all sorts of amazing things about our planet, which Kill we love because it's the best. Yeah. All right. The Lucy mission, which has not yet launched, its launch window opens in nine days. Uh, Lucy is a NASA mission that is targeting the Trojan asteroids around Jupiter. Those are those groups of asteroids that precede and trail Jupiter in its orbit in the same orbit. Uh, and Lucy is visiting seven asteroids in one mission. There's one main belt asteroid that's snuck in there, but there are six Trojans um, that span a whole range of different types of asteroids that each record a different part of solar system history. Uh, and it's going to be, you know, monitoring, uh, sorry, not monitoring, but, uh, cataloging surface geology, color and composition of asteroids, potential satellites and ring systems. Uh, one of the one of the targets is actually a binary asteroid. Yeah, it's a twofer um, right there. Yeah, it's a twofer. It's great. Uh, and these are going to be some of the, the closest images we're getting of these types of asteroids that we've ever seen, uh, as well as the first mission to actually visit Trojan asteroids as opposed to just main belt asteroids, which are cool. But they're not Trojan asteroids, which uh, probe a different type of solar system dynamics and a different part of the history of the evolution of our solar system. The, so the, that's launching in nine of days. Orbital mechanics, right? Like the speaking the of. whatever calculations they went through to get a main belt asteroid, six Trojan asteroids, six Trojan, Trojan on, asteroids on the different sides of like in two of yeah. both of Jupiter's trojan groups but also the collection like they were able to get the different types of trojan asteroids so some that are mm -hmm. much more like main belt asteroids some which are a lot more like kuiper belt objects like they really yeah. got a great some which collection. are very primordial or we mm -hmm. think we've, they're very primordial yeah. um it's pretty incredible the first fly asteroid flyby is going to be 2025 and then it'll be eight more years of flybys of all the different asteroids so it'll be a very long lasting mission there'll just be loads of science yeah. for at least a decade yeah. or more. Wait, can, I, can I ask quickly yeah. wait, what, what the definition of a Trojan asteroid is and, and how is it different from just a moon? Uh, Trojan asteroids are groupings of asteroids that are at uh, different Lagrange points with uh, that co-orbit with a planet. So hmm. Jupiter has a group of asteroids that are at the same orbital separation from the sun, uh, but they... Uh, there's a group that precedes Jupiter at a Lagrange point and then a grouping that trails Jupiter at a Lagrange point. So uh, some of we, well, we think that some of them can have the same sort of compositions and uh, grain structures and mineral structures as main belt asteroids. But by and large, we don't really know all that much about them because they're uh, too far away for us to see from ground-based satellites and none of our Jupiter missions ever really got close to them. So we think think we have some like very broad generalizations about what types of asteroids what types of rocks they are and things like that but actually getting up close and getting to map their surface compositions how much they've been cratered or altered on the surface or weathered uh, will really help us understand a lot about um, sort of that period of solar system history when those rocks were created so there are as many objects in jupiter's trojan belts <clears throat> as there are in the main asteroid belt like it's literally a second asteroid belt that you didn't even know about. Yeah. It's a lot. Wow. How can that be? It must be so dense. <laughs> or they're small. I don't know. Wow, I never there's heard just that. A lot of I objects. guess we will see. Yeah, there's just a lot of objects. The, Jupiter's gravity is wow. is really intense. And so and so it throws stuff in. It's constantly pushing stuff out of the main asteroid belt and also driving stuff into it and also capturing stuff in these Trojan regions keeping some stuff for yeah. themselves and earth has them well, too they're just right. like the trojan Not asteroids in earth's maybe. uh orbit are tiny because just little small guys yeah small. yeah like just like five kilometers <laughs> across and stuff while the ones in jupiter are, are hundreds of kilometers across dozens of kilometers across yeah. okay i have more. three more. More, more i'm gonna more. go i'm gonna go i'm gonna go quickly there's gonna be two really fast ones and then the big guy at the end uh which we all know uh, in late October, October 21st, South Korea is launching a rocket. Uh, it is the Korea Space Launch Vehicle 2 called Nuri, uh, and it is their first launch from their new space center. And 
We're really excited about this one because it is going to be um, their first commercial rocket program that's going to be servicing Southeast Asia uh, at a cheaper rate than what Southeast Asian space companies or space centers can get from other rockets. So it's really going to end up being a staple for uh, space flight in that region of the world, uh, sort of built on like the SpaceX rocket type model. Um, but we're really excited to see that kind of launch. It's going to end up being uh, serving their uh, some of their Earth observing missions that they're planning and also um, some lunar missions that they're planning uh, starting in about 2030. So keep an eye out for that at the end of October. And uh, the last small one is NASA's, not a small one, NASA's DART mission, which is actually a joint mission with NASA and ESA, which will have a follow-up to this. It is the double asteroid redirection test where we're going to shoot an asteroid to see if we can shove it out of place. <laughs> it is visiting a binary asteroid system, uh, the Didymos system. It has a big, big asteroid and a much smaller satellite. That's the one we're going to try and shove out of place. What do they call the moon? It's like a joke. Diddy on... moon. Diddy moon. That's it. Diddy moon. Yeah. The yeah, Diddy yeah. moon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So they're going to. So Dart is going to visit the Diddy moon. It is going to crash into the Diddy moon and try and shove it a little bit. Uh, and then the European Space Agency is going to send a follow up that will study how the orbital dynamics of this collision uh, has changed before and after and also study a lot of the byproducts of the collision itself. And this is part of the planetary protection program idea of if there ever were, which there's not, uh, a deadly asteroid headed towards Earth, could we actually shove it out of the way? Like, what would we need to do? And this is a, uh, a miniature concept of yeah. that. This is so cool. I mean, it's to cool. finally take the threat of asteroids seriously enough to try to reach out and smash one out of the way is... We don't know of any yet. Do not freak out. But no. it's better to have a plan in place ahead of sure. time than but to I mean, try and in the next <laughs> mock something up in, in the moment. 65 million years or so, one has our number. Yep. So. It'll, it'll come eventually, and yep. it's best that we know what to do before it gets here. It might make for a good movie, but not so much good for real life. Yeah. All right. And the Big Kahuna, which is uh, James Webb Space Telescope, uh, is work we're working on it. Uh, there were a couple of delays over the summer and the fall for launch. The currently scheduled launch date, knock on wood, is December 18th. Uh, and at the moment, things look okay for that launch date. You can notice all of the caveats in my voice. <laughs> As I'm saying this, things look okay currently scheduled, knock on wood. Yeah. Um, the testing, all of the testing is complete. The shipment operations, which, uh, you know, folding it up, getting everything into what it needs to do to get it to ship, those are complete-ish. Uh, they have not actually announced that, but they said by the end of September. So they're probably complete. Everything is really hush hush right now because now it's in the transport operations stage and they're yeah. keeping all of that very much under wraps because it has to travel by boat across the sea uh, through the Panama Canal to its launch yeah. site. Pirates. In South <laughs> and there's all sorts of security concerns. Yeah. So they're keeping all of that very much under wraps. It's so funny. They won't they won't provide the actual details of the passage when it's yeah. going to be passing through the Panama Canal, et cetera, because yep. of pirates. Because of, of piracy concerns and Yar. security concerns. Um, there are media events scheduled at the launch site uh, in November, in early November, where they say that we'll be able, we, I'm not going, but media will be able to see the telescope before it goes into the launch vehicle. So one can uh, say that sometime this month it will make a journey. No, the, the particulars are all like, nah, whatever. Mm -hmm. I could have sworn I saw on Twitter today that someone said it's in the Panama Canal as we speak. It, were they just Oh, pulling... if it is, I did not see that, but I would okay. be very interested. Know. If someone had a map of like all the ships passing through the canal and they were like, it's one of those. And then it's like decoy ships and everything. You sure it you wasn't know. that, uh, you know, I, that meme of that, uh, the one that blocked the Suez oh, Canal. 
<laughs> could have been Ever Given. Oh, yeah, man. Maybe the Ever it Given. could be. They it put, could be. They put it on the Ever Given. Yeah. Well, well, the telescope is either currently in route or soon to be in route yeah. or maybe eventually will be in route. Already One of space, those options. Or already being used by pirates. Perhaps. <laughs> look, at, look at me. I'm the NASA administrator now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Pirate, pirate, oh pirate telescope. Um, uh, yeah. Did you, did you have, a, you had one, one more? Or was that the big one? Nope. That was, that was it. Okay. Uh, and I just wanted to say that the, as all of this is going on, uh, eventually we will learn that it has arrived safely, knock on wood. Um, yeah. they're still, uh, doing all sorts of testing, uh, getting the communication systems and the computer systems, uh, up and running and testing everything here. Uh, in Baltimore, uh, the Space Tele uh, Telescope Science Institute, they're rehearsing launch procedures. Things are still very much in motion. People are working around the clock. Um, and once it launches, knock on wood, uh, science operations are expected to start about six months after launch. So keep an eye out for that. Oh, and there's that straight month of unfolding terror. Yeah. Oh. Well, we well, had seven minutes of terror yeah. <laughs> for Mars. We That's exactly had it. Yeah, Mars had seven minutes of terror. Many... James Webb has has thirty um, days of terror. So, if you know oh, a a I'm... JWST scientist or operator, okay. be kind to them during that month. Kimberly, They're stressed. Can, I just want to ask you for permission right now. Can I steal that concept for an article we'll do on Universe Today? I'm going to. You have it. my permission. Thank you. We're going to entitle it. 30 days of terror james webb's 30 days of terror because there are you heard it here first all folks. of these actuators that have to unfold each one if anyone goes we wrong, love actuators and reaction wheels here oh, oh, oh love them yeah yeah i can't think i'm trying to think when's the last time an, an actuator didn't function galileo's main antenna that was a nightmare anyway that's all the updates I have for you on satellites. So it was missed, longer than I expected. I apologize, Chris. You missed one very important human spaceflight mission that's happening next week. What am I missing? William Shatner is flying to space on Blue Origin. Whatever. I, I almost picked that as my article. Oh. <laughs> oh. What, what if it was Mark Hamill, Kimberly? Then you'd be better. down with it. That's yeah. better. That's better. Oh. That's better. Star Wars. Star Wars in this house. <laughs> Yeah, Star Wars in this, in this person. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I forgot the uh, the the division between us. Yeah, if they'd right. gotten Leonard Nimoy up there a couple like a decade ago, I would have been much happier. So so would, so would my wife. Ruth is really a big fan of Leonard Nimoy. Without Leonard Nimoy, Star Trek is just meaningless to her at this point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Russia just sends a, a film crew up to the That's space right. station. Yeah, that's pretty wild. Yeah, we got an actress up there and mm -hmm. someone who's directing. We and, can you know, have a whole nother up, discussion about Kim's opinions straight. on commercial space flight, <laughs> but that today is not that day. All right, it's a whole new world. <laughs> we'll do that one. They do it next time. Can you just put that in the docket, Kim? Sure. I hate yeah. commercial space flight. Let me tell you why, or something like that. Perfect. You've been talking to me for how many years, and you're just now figuring this out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, all right, what do you got, Chris? Well, that was a lot of satellites. So, so uh, I'll, I'll close out the shop here. So I, I'll be talking about the Milky Way's broken arm. So first of all, it's a great headline. So it definitely got me clicking on the article. So spiral arms are, are pretty ubiquitous across the universe. Pretty much every disk galaxy that we see has them in some form. And finding spiral structure in other galaxies is pretty easy you just look at it but for the milky way gathering an accurate picture from within the galaxy can be quite difficult and as we'll see we're still learning new things about how how our native spiral structure works in all its sort of details and intricate features so i'm here to talk about a recent discovery of this broken spur-like structure of shooting out at around 45 degrees uh from the, the nearest spiral arm to the uh, nearby, nearby the solar system. So something that people may not know is that spiral arms of the Milky Way actually have names. Uh, in fact, there's this cool graphic uh, I found, which will currently be my background Whoa. for a moment. 
How come you guys didn't provide a background for your story? I'm not as cool as Chris is. Yeah, so as you Chris, can see, it's just like won, a... You just won the weatherman. Space hangout. <laughs> <laughs> He's a weatherman. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, so here's like a cartoon like schematic of, of the Milky Way. And there are pretty much four major arms uh, that that are sort of sort of commonly agreed upon. Like there's the there's the Norma arm. Then a little bit beyond that, you have the the Suctum arm. Then you have the Sagittarius arm, and then you have this sort of um, loose structure called the local arm that kind of isn't isn't really an arm. But then beyond that, you have the the Perseus arm. And so these are kind of like the four sort of main spiral arms of the of the Milky Way uh, that are sort of commonly agreed upon as a as prominent structure. Uh, but for but for our work, the well, my, my not our work, but the but the arm that's important for this study is the Sagittarius arm. Uh, and so that arm is actually so the the so the scientists behind this work, they were able to use infrared data from uh, from NASA's uh, Spitzer telescope to pierce the the dense uh, gas clouds of the spiral arm um, to see the sort of the new forming stars or sort of within the arm, and so they combine that with so sort of these refined kinematic and distance measurements from the third uh, data release from Gaia uh, for these young stars. So that so that allows them to sort of form these sort of in depth three D maps of the Sagittarius arm. And isolate uh, the this splitting feature uh, that uh, that is that is increasingly becoming resolved with our uh, with our increased distance measurements. So, so what happened to the arm? Like Good question. So, so I think we have to step back to first, like, what is a disc? So, the disc is what we call a a, a it has a differential rotation, uh, so meaning that its angular frequency uh, decreases with the radius, um, while its rotational velocity flattens out at large at large distances, like due to the dark matter. Uh, and since the rotational frequency is just like v divided by r, and as r gets bigger, uh, the angular frequency decreases with greater distance. So the prevailing view on how you can get a structure like this is, let's say you have a very clumpy part of the Sagittarius arm where, where these new stars are forming. And, and, and due to that differential rotation, the, over time, that, that sort of clumpy structure will get sheared apart due to the rotational, due to the rotational nature of the disk. Uh, and so, so in the end, that can sort of get you these sort of thin spur-like structures breaking away from the main arm. And this thin structure, it's about 300 light years long, so about one kiloparsec, and which is like quite significant uh, of a deviation. And quite interesting, uh, a lot of the well-known nebulae in the sky uh, were found to be associated with this structure. So like the Eagle Nebula, which contains the famous like Pillars of Creation, the Omega ne Nebula, and the Lagoon Nebula are each thought to, to be associated with this spur-like structure you're seeing in the Sagittarius arm. And it's only recently with these refined measurements from Gaia that we're actually able to have really good distances to these popular objects and place it within its uh, structure, place it within its uh, structure within the larger uh, Milky Way context. So, so is this like, when I kind of imagine a spiral galaxy like the Milky Way and, you know, you see those spiral arms, I'm imagining, like, I understand that the arms aren't, aren't actually stars. They're density waves as the, you know, you've got the central rotation of the disc. And as you've got these clumps that are moving and turning, different stars spend time in the spiral arms. And during those periods, you get certain amounts of, of star formation. But... Mm -hmm. Does the configuration of the arms change over time? Like, I don't know, I'm thinking, imagining sort of like a river over time, the river, new channels form. And what was a, you know, maybe in the past, the Milky Way had four spiral arms and maybe now it has two and the spiral arms are different shapes and sizes. 
and we're watching one of these changes in real time is is am i a crazy person i know it's two separate questions. oh not at all i, yeah, I think okay. you're i think you're uh it's about as crazy as many sort of galactic dynamics yeah because uh, in fact this is like sort of a prevailing uh argument and in, in behind the theory of, of spiral arm formation whether or not spiral arms are are transient whether or not these are sort of features you're seeing for only a short time in the galaxy or are they long-lived structures that are uh, that can persist for billions of years? And the answer to that really relates to how the spiral arms are coming about in the first place. So, if the spiral arms are a product of of a of a disturbance in the mass density, as you're describing, like the the more uh, uh, density wave um, uh, uh, theory then yeah, those, those structures can be long lived and last for billions of years. So if the spiral arms were a product of a recent encounter, like with a, with a neighboring satellite, then that can disturb the matter distribution in such a way that these spiral arms can, can be there and persist for quite a while. Um, but if the spiral features are just present, say like in the stellar distribution or in the gas, uh, I think these are commonly referred as a flocculent spiral yes. arms, then then these are these are quite transient, and over time, they the the pattern winds up. So, in a matter of a few hundreds of millions of years, as the disk rotates, the the features are mixed up, uh, mm -hmm. and into the into the into the into the disk, and so they it eventually sort of withers away. And so, this break in the Milky Way's spiral arms is not the first time this has happened, and it won't be the last. Like this is just part of how the galaxy changes and evolves over time. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, we've we've actually been able to see these the spur-like structures in other disk galaxies, and so it, it was really a question of whether or not the Milky Way, if whether or not the spiral arms are smooth or possess these sort of wicked uh, offshoots in the form of these spurs. And so this is a, a step in that in the direction of 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 realizing that full complicated spiral structure of the Milky Way. That's really cool. Um, it's it's. Again, it, it always just baffles me that we have any idea of what the Milky Way structure is because we're living in the middle of it. It is literally like asking you, what does the outside of your house look like? And you looking at reflections off of cars driving by or buildings that are across the road and just getting slight hints of what it even looks like. Yep, and that's why uh, every every night before bed, every galactic dynamicist bows at the at the shroud uh, of Gaia for yes. all hail Gaia. <laughs> yeah. The hardest working telescope in, in space exploration. Yeah. I love Gaia. That's such a good mission. All right. Well, we've reached the, the end of our hour. Uh, I had to shift to the Brady bunch view just because, uh, I, I just, can't manage switching back cameras back and forth and zoom wasn't going to behave so hopefully this is the last time this we go through this um before we close things up i want to give people the chance to uh shamelessly self-promote what they're working on and for people to be able to find out more so alex back around to the beginning uh what are you working on uh i am working on finding planets in tests uh this is my first time doing like a legitimate uh planet search uh, with a, a student uh, that I've been working with. His name is Chetan Chawla, and he's going to be applying for graduate uh, program soon. So I hope he uh, finds a place somewhere because he's fabulous and he's been uh, doing a lot of great work looking for these planets in TESS. And I'm also uh, working with uh, microlensing, looking for exomoons uh, with the with microlensing. This is, you know, people have done, done a little bit of this stuff, but uh, it's, it's pretty awesome. Microlensing is amazing. And, there was a... and I'm just sort of dipping my toe into it, but... There was a paper we just covered on Universe Today. I don't know if you saw this, talking about a technique for finding moons by looking for magnetospheres. That that there's like a way that the interaction between the planet and the and the moon would generate a magnetosphere in a in a very specific way that would give off a telltale signal, and you could infer the moon is there. 
Uh, I'm not sure if I saw that particular paper, but yeah, these sorts of uh, planet moon interactions, uh, you know, we're still trying to come up with novel ways yeah. of finding these things, uh, short of having, you know, data that we can really just pick the moons out uh, easily. Yeah. Uh, you know, you go, you go back to the chalkboard and, and try to dream up of like, you know, new, uh, new ways of, of doing it. So it's, it's, these papers are coming out all the time, people coming up with yeah. novel approaches yeah. and they're all, they're all pretty interesting. So if people want to follow what you're doing, where should they go? Uh, follow me on Twitter is the best place, at Alex Teaching. Perfect. Kimberly. Yeah, so I've been spending a lot of my time uh, getting ready for a very exciting e live streaming event that uh, EOS, which is the magazine that I write for, is putting on at the end of October. Uh, we're partnering with a very familiar face and friend of Weekly Space Hangout, Paul Matt Sutter, to host this live streaming event with us and talking with some of the first astronomers we're going to be using JWST to study exoplanets so cool. and what are they expecting to find. And so registration for this event opens tomorrow. So it's been a very uh, exciting lead up to when registration for the live streaming event opens. You can find all the links to that on my Twitter tomorrow, actually, uh, at Astro Kim Cartier uh, and AG, at AGU underscore EOS, uh, all of that will be up. So that's what that's what I've been doing for the past month. <laughs> that's exciting. cool. I, I I love the fact like you did a profile of Morgan. You're yeah. bringing Paul friends of the show, Paul bringing you into, into my job. Fold. I feel yes. like you know, like we are now turning into the old guard of space media, and uh, all these connections are starting to to pay off for everybody. So I'm yes. glad you're able to to keep paying it forward. As I've said, WSH, WSH has been just a fabulous networking experience as well. And yeah. it is paying dividends and I love it here and I'm going to keep coming back. Right anyway, on. check out registration links tomorrow. Excellent. All right, Chris, what are you working on? I, I've mostly just been working on a, a slew of papers that I, I hope to finally get out before the end of the year on all things galaxies, either about the Milky Way and its encounter with Sagittarius. Uh, and also in some pin and paper theories about galaxy formation. So I've been working on that. And also I eventually have to start thinking about my thesis and <laughs> formulate how, how all that fits together. Yeah. One does not simply think about their thesis, I believe is, is how that, how that goes, <laughs> but, <laughs> but enjoy. Um, thanks. Praise Gaia, of course. For yes. Much. Praise Gaia. And if you want to follow me and learn more, Follow me on Twitter or at, at the real C car. Fantastic. Uh, so I've got two cool interviews coming tomorrow morning on my channel. Um, one is all about the uh, the principal investigator behind this paper on these Hycean planets, these hydrogen atmosphere rich ocean worlds that have a much more forgiving habitable zone range than traditional terrestrial planets. So it's sort of an eye opening way to look at habitability of planets. Uh, that's at 8 a.m. Pacific. And then people like to book their interviews one after the other. So I'm then interviewing the uh, the developer of one of the new NIAC awards, the Enceladus Vent Explorer. And so this is a mission that's going to theoretically land on Enceladus and crawl down into one of the tiger stripe vents and search for evidence of life on Enceladus. So we're going to get into the deep details on that. And then following that, I've got an interview. It's not booked yet, but with um, one of the people from Perseverance, who is responsible for collecting samples with Perseverance. We're going to talk about how samples are collected, how they're chosen, why Perseverance is such fumble fingers and turns them to dust, and how they're all going to come back home from, uh, from Mars. So stay tuned on all of that. All right. Uh, well, we've reached the end of the show. Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching, sticking around, even through the disaster of uh, software fail, Fraser fail, host fail. Starlink. I'm going to blame it on Starlink. Why not, right? <laughs> um, Always a safe bet. Yeah, it's a safe bet. Yeah. Elon Musk. Um, thank you to everyone watching our special guest. Thanks to everyone who is uh, tuning in on YouTube. Really appreciate it. And a special thanks, as always, to Nancy Graziano for organizing everything. We literally could not do this without you. So thank you, Nancy. And we will see all of you next week. Thanks, everyone. Welcome back. We did it. 
See y'all. Now, how do I turn this off? Wait. Yes. No. There it is. Got it. All right.